Winfall and welcome to the Eugene Public Library. We're so glad to have you here tonight. Um, and I want to thank our sponsors, the Lane Literary Guild, the Friends of the Library, the Library Foundation, and the Lane Arts Council with support from the City of Eugene Cultural Services Division. And I also want to give special thanks to Anita Sullivan and Kim Ballum for coordinating Winfalls over the past, so well, since 2009. And this is the very last one that they will coordinate. So thank you, thank you. summer after tonight's event and then reconvene in September and uh, Tony Han and Michael Hanner will be uh, leading the windfalls starting in the fall and there's the lineup sheets in the back if you guys want to pick one out on your way out if you haven't already there's a great lineup for next year so we're excited and Sammy Roderick Rojas Chua oh, is yes. coordinating it with us Oh, okay, wonderful. Yes, and he is also the one who designed the handout and designed these wonderful, beautiful signs. So thank you to Sam as well. Okay, uh, before we get started, a couple of housekeeping items. Um, please go ahead and silence your cell phones now if you haven't done so already. There's restrooms on the other side of the wall, and we have beverages over here, so uh, feel free to help yourselves to those, and feel free to um, purchase the author's wonderful book at the end of the program or during the break, which we'll have halfway um, throughout the program. Now please welcome Anita Sullivan from the Lane Literary Guild, who will introduce our first reader. Well, hello everybody, and thanks for coming out on this rainy evening. Louder, please. Keep the mic. Uh, all right. <laughs> yes. Well, my father used to always say I didn't need a mic. <laughs> but anyway, uh, our program tonight will be uh, approximately an hour and 15 minutes, and we'll have a 10-minute break in between, and uh, I believe there's going to be a little musical component of the evening, so that's something special to look forward to. I'm not sure exactly when that's going to come, but that, that's up to the readers. As you probably know, and Allison mentioned, there's... Um, books for sale, but also on the back table there are a number of um, announcement type items to, to take a careful look at, one, one of which is, is uh, has to do with a, an upcoming reading at Tsunami on June the 1st, so don't uh, fail to take a look at those announcements. Tonight we're going to hear poems from an anthology with a haunting title, Before There Is Nowhere to Stand. Oh, this this could be the, the theme title for our era, the era we live in, I think. It could be, if you didn't know anything about this book ahead of time and you saw the title, Before There Is Nowhere to Stand, it, it could be a book written by polar bears or bees, uh, all kinds of other people in the world. However, it is indeed a, a book, an anthology of poems from um, Palestine and Israel, that part of the world, from people who have an intimate connection. And I'll just read from the introduction that tells you a little bit about how the book came about. In 2009, the editors, Joan Doby and Grace Beeler, both Jewish descendants of Holocaust survivors, reeling against the atrocities of Israel's Operation Cast Lead, the Gaza, the Gaza Massacre, issued a call for poetry. The ad, first posted in Poets and Writers, read, Are you Jewish or Palestinian? Of Palestinian or Jewish heritage? Please submit poetry for an anthology that strives for understanding in these troubled times. All points of view wanted in the belief that poetry can create understanding and understanding can dull hatred. And when they said all points of view wanted, that's what they meant. And, that, and this book bears witness to that. It is uh, uh, in her introduction to the book that uh, poet and essayist Alice Ostracker says, the need to go on hoping forms the bedrock of this book. And she says further, referring to hope as a spring, hope too surges toward release. What feeds that spring is irresistible human empathy. So hope and Human empathy are irresistible against all the atrocities of the world, we, we hope. 
We invite you to listen to three local poets who have contributed to this anthology, which is an international in scope and has people from all over the world writing uh, to it, contributing to it. And the, the names of the three poets who will be here, who are here tonight, um, Ingrid Wendt, Sabina Stark, and Joan Doby, who is one of the co-editors. So I'm going to turn the program over to these three local poets. I, she just said everything I was going to say. <laughs> so, I don't actually have any poems in this book. I just gathered poems and put them in. But I did write poems in the making of it. And I'm going to re read you one that I wrote a minute after talking to my niece Gracie and we were like agonizing, what can we do, what can we do, what can we do after hearing about the bombing of Gaza by Israel. Very, I mean, it's happening again now, so who knows, but this was 2009. Um, these are my people. These are my people whose bombs fall on children. These hard-hearted Jews who still stink of the ovens of Auschwitz. My uncles, aunts, cousins, nieces, nephews, selves I do not know, whose terrified parents escaped to the Holy Land, howling never, never, never again, buried their souls in the sand, planted American trees and learned how to kill. A land without soul is far less than holy, and blind fear drops its fire on those without cover. No wonder we other Jews, safe in America, Rise in our beds night after night facing demons. Come morning we face our own selves. So that's how it all began. And we did ask for poems that said, are you Jewish or Palestinian, and, and would you write? But we got poems from all sorts of people. And the first person to read tonight is Ingrid Wendt, who is not Jewish or Palestinian, but has a heart big enough to take up a planet. <laughs> Thank you all for coming. Thank you, Joan. Thank you, the Literary Guild, for setting this up. Um, my poem is taking place, some of you may know this poem, is taking place on the tip of the Sinai Peninsula. As Joan said, I'm neither Jewish nor Palestinian. Um, I haven't spent time in Gaza. I haven't spent time in Jerusalem. I've been on the outside looking in as may be the case of, with many of you. Some of you may have been to one of those places, but I would suspect most of us have not. Um, and I was, I was lucky enough to spend a week at the tip of the Sinai Peninsula exploring the land and exploring the sea around it um, as a snorkeler and as a diver. And uh, my husband, Ralph Salisbury, and I went on a snorkeling expedition truly around the very tip of the Sinai Peninsula. Um, we started out in the Gulf of Suez and went around the tip to the, or excuse me, we started out in the Gulf of Aqaba and ended up in the Gulf of Suez in the Red Sea. And we had such wonders below us as we were snorkeling that we decided to go back again after the guide had showed us the first time how to go. We went again by ourselves and got off course and were attacked, truly, by a surgeon fish. Not to be confused with sturgeon. The surgeon fish, it's a tropical fish, it has very sharp dorsal fins, and it'll come up alongside you like that and slice, try to slice. And that's how it defends itself. And they were coming straight at us, um, I got a cut on my leg, it was not serious, it took a while to heal, but um, that prompted all kinds of reflections. Uh, you will hear three different narratives in this poem. It's easier to see on the page, and someday I'm going to show it on the screen as I read. One narrative is, I'm talking with the four, or fourth grade son of a friend, 
shortly after returning to the States. He had written a little fourth grade novel about surgeon fish, yeah. not knowing that I had had an experience with one myself. So Glenn, Helen Frost's son, Glenn, when he was in fourth grade, is in this poem. Also in this poem is the story of snorkeling. And the uh, other narrative that comes in, and it's sort of in the, in the different position on the page, is that of what has just happened before I started writing the poem. Shortly after we returned, uh, this Israeli Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin was assassinated. And I was listening to news of that and the commentator's analysis, which gets into the poem. My explanation takes longer than the poem itself, so I'm going to start reading Surgeon Fish. And um, I will invite you, after I read this poem, to join me as I continue to learn from the poets who of Israeli or Palestinian heritage who are in this book. What I don't tell Glenn when I respond to his prize-winning fourth grade novel about the spined Avenger could fill a book and has done and keeps on being rewritten, rewritten. Although it really can be scary, I tell him. I know from experience, yes, that fish really will attack. You've chosen your brave protagonist well. But Ralph and I were swimming too close, I tell him, to spawning gut grounds. Eggs or newly hatched young. Or maybe that leveled off part of the reef was their own. Last night on TV, the foreign minister saying, for some, it's always been land that must be defended. For others, it's life. And the surgeon fish, two of them, named for the bright orange scalpel sharp fin at the base of the tail, striking from out of the blue, head on, then swerving, flack glancing the whole length of our bodies again and again. We must have looked funny, flailing, thrashing the surface like runners dodging a sniper, like puppets unstrung. But they were beautiful. That's what we'd come for, such color. The neon indigo stripes of the black scaled surgeon fish, neon indigo edging the top and bottom black fins, edging the tail, that pectoral fin close to the gills, such a bright daffodil sun. And this just one of the many others named in my book and on Glenn's video game. <coughs> They're real. And here we swam, I draw for him, his carpet, our sand, the Gulf of Aqaba, Gulf of Suez, around the tip of the Sinai. Behind us, that many-storied mountain, the sacred remains of St. Catherine, somewhere the spot where Moses received God's law. We swam. Behind us, magic lake, not far inland, the whitest sand, the water a turquoise like nothing we'd ever seen. We posed for photos. Glenn, your resolution, I tell him, is wonderfully balanced, mature. The way the spined avenger saves the reef from Scarface the shark. Without fighting, they sign an agreement. What is the whole or even half of the story? Our guide, Mr. Jamal, in the last, the sixth day, war fought at Magic Lake. Where we posed, he saw men fall. I don't say Israel, Egypt, Anwar Sadat, Rabin. Mr. Jamal, our guide, didn't use wetsuit or fins. The currents were strong. Only an arm away to our right, the reef dropped off into darkness, down, down, 2,000 feet down. And all we could see was beauty. Our next reader will be Joan, reading a poem by John Michael Simon. She'll tell you a bit about that. All right. I don't know 
Michael, John Michael Simon. I emailed with him and his partner. They're Israelis. And um, maybe very, a little bit nationalistic Israelis. But John Michael's a good poet. Waters of Gaza by John Michael Simon. They moved out of Gaza, not without protest, not without prayer feeling like ivy ripped off the walls, like irrigation pipes torn from the soil. They moved out on unwilling legs, on buses to nowhere, fathers, mothers, children, and children without fathers, without mothers. They moved into Gaza, not without covet, not without envy, feeling like water released from a dam bursting into surrendering fields, carrying all before it, trees, houses, places of prayer, fences, gardens, waves breaking over alien temples, again and again, till water covered all. After the water came briny hatred, lusting for a redder liquid, and the sky darkened again, lightning and thunder returned to Gaza rained on this thin strip of unhappiness, writhing between the wrath of history and the dark depth of the sea. And Sabina will read from Darwish, um, a journal of ordinary grief. Ibrahim Muhawi, who some of you might know, who lives here in Eugene, translated this book, and it's Ibrahim's translation she's reading from. Mom would Darwish translated by Ibrahim. Thank you all for coming. I'm actually going to read a different poem. We, we have resorted this. Um, uh, one of our readers, uh, unfortunately, was became ill, so we, we had to do a last-minute redivying. Um, I'm going to read a poem by Rachel Baron Blot, and she's an ordained rabbi. Um, she is a published poet and has a has a website and a blog called The Velveteen Rabbi. <laughs> and this piece is called In the Same Key. They came together to bury their father in a cave where Sarah's body lies. No one imagines the vaulted church-turned mosque with painted ceilings, or the synagogue, or metal detectors to keep armed men from getting through. Isaac and Ishmael wash him with water and sprinkle sand on his eyelids, so his visions in the world to come will derive from the land he loved. Isaac's memories of having a brother and then losing him without explanation. Ishmael's memories of aching thirst before his mother saw the spring go unmentioned. The bones of their past buried beneath the drifting sands. Outside the cave, women wail, two families grieving in the same key. Not yet the ancestors of enemies. Abraham's dark eyes in every face. And now we'll hear from Ingrid Wendt, the Darwish poem. Mahmoud Darwish is, uh, <coughs> was one of uh, the most preeminent uh, Palestinian poets Ever. Um, his dates of birth and death were 1942 to 2008. Um, he was evacuated, joined constant um, displacement um, as a Palestinian. He was born in Palestine. Um, he 
published over 30 books of poems, some of which are set to music. Um, he is a widely anthologized. And Ibrahim Muhawi of Eugene um, did the translation from the book Journal of an Ordinary Grief, which won a major award from Penn International. And Ibrahim was not able to be with us today to read this, but he is the translator of Mahmoud Darwish. And this selection in the book is titled uh, A Journal, or it's just an excerpt, excerpt number three. What are you doing, Father? I'm searching for my heart, which fell away that night. He's talking about the displacement. Do you think you'll find it here? Where else am I going to find it? I bend to the ground and pick it up piece by piece, just as the women of the Falahim pick up olives in October, one olive at a time. But you're picking up pebbles? Doing that is a good exercise for memory and perception. Who knows? Maybe these pebbles are petrified pieces of my heart. Mm -hmm. And even if they're not, I would still have gotten used to the effort of searching on my own for something that made me feel lost when it was lost. The mere act of searching is proof that I refuse to get lost in my loss. The other side of this effort is the proof that I am in fact lost as long as I have not found what I have lost. What else are you doing, Father? When I chance upon pebbles that look like my heart, I transform them with my fingers on fire into words that put me in touch with a distant homeland. We then become a language that can turn into flesh. Is there something else you want to say? I do, but I don't understand the words, for the woman I'm talking to turns into another exile. When you were young, were you afraid of the moon? That's what they say. But it's not true that children are always afraid of the moon. If it weren't for the moon, I would have become an orphan before my time. It hadn't yet fallen into the well. It was higher than my forehead and closer than the mulberry tree in the middle of my grandfather's yard. The dog used to bark when the full moon rose. When the first shots rang out, I was surprised that a wedding celebration should be taking place that evening. And when they led me away to join the long caravan, the moon was our companion on a road that later I understood was the road of exile. Sabina will read a poem by Naomi Shihab Nye, No More. Naomi Shihab Nye is an award-winning poet. She's published, um, written, uh, and or edited over 30, um, over 30 books. This is called Knowing. On April 16th, 1953, Eleanor Roosevelt wrote a letter to my father, answering one of his own. No, she said, I do not think Arab refugees should be permitted to return to their homes in Israel. There are few homes to return to. His face, perfect burn of indignation. He would carry his stolen home into the next millennium and never enter it again, though it remains intact till now. She numbered her answers, too. I do not know if it is advisable to internationalize Jerusalem. She had worked for black youth, the unemployed. She helped to found the United Nations. She stood up for Marian Anderson when they wouldn't let her sing, my dad at 25 trying to support a wife and baby in a tired American city, dreamed his own place international so he might be included again. He wanted to sing. In 2010, the same questions dangle in the air. Three, I do not know if there should be an Arab Palestine as an independent state side by side with Israel. Very sincerely yours, she signed the letter, with a shaky hand from her perch at Val Kill Cottage, Hyde Park, Dutchess County, New York. 
such a nice address, unencumbered by numbers or thieves. Eleanor did not know. She was honest about not knowing. She would die at 78 from bone marrow tuberculosis. He would die at 80, still frustrated, still writing letters. We live on puzzles of power, unraveling around us, building new walls, proclaiming, protesting, one phrase worth clinging to, side by side. My mother says he wrote her often. This was not her only reply. I'd like to invite Ingrid one back. Sharon Dubiago, whose poem I'm going to read next, uh, could not be with us today. She was ill, and we didn't find out, in this, as we've already said, until just, re just a little while ago. Uh, so we've been restructuring. I'm going to read Sharon's poem here. Sharon is the author of over two, two dozen books of poems. She's won the Oregon Book Award, many other awards. Uh, the poem is from a book that uh, is titled, no, it's a book-life poem, Me Nazarene, which was written for her Palestinian grandson, born the night the Gulf War started. Sharon Dubiago, playing Oslo pool with Mahmoud Darwish for Ryan 1993 for Palestine. On our honeymoon, we visited you in Paris. That picture of my carrying you down the street in the Arab arrondissement. Your father took Johnny down to the local bar to play pool with Mahmoud Darwish. I was not invited. Johnny didn't know who Mahmoud Darwish was, not really, nor really the poet I am. But there, over the pool table, the voice of Palestine said to my men, yes, I know her work. Sometime that week, your father came in from the Oslo agreements, sat down at the little kitchen table and announced, we just lost the war. Still in diapers, you kept playing with your big red truck out on the balcony, your nose running, mouth drooling, allergic to something, and that night had one of your infamous tantrums. We were sleeping on the living room floor, 12 stories up, sniffling and stuffed up too. That's how I knew the allergy was from the toxic floor. Your screaming goes on and on in the bedroom. Your father has taken over from your mother, his voice rising and rising. I'm afraid he's going to snap. How can he not? Backed against the wall, he demands you stop it, descending deeper and deeper into his own hysteria, into you and all he's lost. Behind us, lifetimes of mothers, letting father take over. Behind me, behind you too. The Cherokee forbade the father from ever disciplining the child. Knowing too much father power always turns toxic. For a long time I lay there on that toxic floor, knowing the right thing but unable to do it, imprisoned in those lifetimes, wanting to on honor his fatherhood, his home. Finally, another unbearable scream of yours. I barged through the door to your beautiful mother, prone on the bed. The Paris nightscape and the big windows silhouetting your beautiful father on the end. Beautiful you on his knees in a confrontation only a crucifixion or nuclear meltdown could resolve. I took you from your father. He let me. Instantly, after hours of hysteria, you were calm. Well, you seem to sigh. It's about time. What took you so long? Amazing, your sense of justice. Your knowing authority is not justice, not even your father. Amazing, you were still in complete faith that right will come to your rescue, that right will restore itself. The next morning, nauseated by what I had done to him, but elated and informed by what I had done for you, I apologized. Your mother, almost always wise, diplomatically sighed, you should have knocked, just asked, can I be of help? 
Yes, of course. Why didn't I think of that in my rush to rescue you? But yes, she said, I felt just like Grandma lying there doing nothing while her child is being abused. Be behind us, lifetimes honoring old gods, allowing their takeover not knowing how to honor and break simultaneously the correct manners, our proper places, sacred rituals, the killers in enforcement, the others, how to put it back together righteously. I am saddened by the news of the great poet's death. The voice of your father's people, one half of you all the way back. I've always expected that little mistake. Just one of the many we were and are bound to make would one day be corrected. Right will restore itself. We will be introduced. I will say, I know your work, Mahmoud Darvish. I will hear him read as I heard your cries that night. And though insulting, incorrect, against the laws, finally acted. Joan Dobby. Hi, I'm going to read a poem by um, Hannah Stein, who grew up in New York and lives in California, and is a member of Jewish Peace Alternatives, a group concerned in, in, in Davis, California. And for those of you who aren't aware, though I'm sure most of you are aware that, you know, Israel's fighting with bombs and guns and Palestinians are fighting with um, rocks and suicide. Body Parts by Hannah Stein. Body Parts. Outside a market, a foot lies on the ground. An arm, skin, leathery and sun-tanned or slack, with blue cables of veins, the freckled, the spotless, the hairy, the smooth. A rabbi in long coat and black hat picks them up. He will save them for burial with the dead, so that on the last day no one will arise without feet, arms. The rabbi puts them in the plastic bag, mixes defenders with attackers. At the last day, all will stand together. And with that, we're going to take a 10 minute break. The author of this poem is Lahab Asef al Juli, and the poem is called Any Refugees in the World. What is the first thing that comes to mind when you hear of refugees? What terror drove them out of their homes? Are they getting help? What is being done for their safe return? Are Palestinians different than other refugees? Is it not their simple right to return to the land they were driven from? Why are they being asked to settle for money? Who designated the Palestinians as the chosen people 
to carry the cross for a guilt-ridden West. Why do po politicians tell them too much time has passed when their grievance is with people who went back after 2,000 years? Between continued warfare and annihilation, coexistence beckons as only the only honorable demographic time for peace now. Judy Cronenfeld of Berkeley, of Berkeley, California. Would you mind giving the page number? Okay, yeah. Um, there are two editions of the book. The edition that I have is one, the first edition is 148, Judy Cronenfeld, Clean. Uh, it has an epigraph with four, it's a list of, of four things on the side of a truck seen on the freeway. And those four things on the side of the truck are Crime Scene Cleaners Incorporated, Homicide, Suicide, Accidental Death. Crime Scene Cleaners. And the title of the poem is Clean. Let them come like priests in white robes and tenderly cleanse the buttocks of the four-year-old who shat in his pants, pressing his ears against the scream of F-16s flying low over Gaza. Order them up for the smashed skull at Haditha, the intense and the intestines spill out of back wounds. The graffiti scrawled house where democracy assassinated a family. Let them restore the accidentally killed children flee fleeing on the road from Marwahin, obeying blasting loudspeakers into their deaths. Order them up for the spattered mall, the hall, the checkpoint, the crossing, the wall. Order them up for the broken-necked girlfriend left to drown in their tub by the returning marine. Order them up for his crazed pain. Order them up for the porta potty splattered with blood. Any soldiers whose wife's bad news is the last strain. Let them, with utmost respect, take down the three smart, creative, committed prisoners who hanged themselves with bed sheets and clothes in Guantanamo. Their act, not desperation, but warfare waged against us. Let them remove the bindings around the necks, the plastic bags over the heads. Let them wash out the shot through mouths of men revenged. Let them relief the golden dome. Let the war presidents and prime ministers and militia leaders for whom war is holy or righteous, abstract, mathematical, even joyous, somehow made clean in the mind, be each given one small toothbrush and the sentence scour this blood. I'm going to read one of my own pieces, and um, it's on page 18. Um, I wrote this poem when I was living in Jerusalem, and uh, for those of you who don't know, I was there during High Holy Days, which is um, a deeply uh, introspective and um, the, uh, the most important um, spiritual journey of the Jewish year. The beginning of that happened in uh, September of 2000, and uh, 
the Second Intifada began on the eve of Rosh Hashanah. Hi, Holy Days. Jerusalem, October 2000. Lost in the dry heart of Yerushalayim, God, like a broken messenger, sleeping through the long day's heat, ears ringing with the sobs of children, lies hidden under the shade of a fig tree. Could these be the holy days the Holy One intended for us to sanctify in this parched corner of the world? Buses still run on my street. People in the neighborhood mourn their lost soldiers. I am quiet in the white cage of my little porch with my newspapers and cold tea only photographs and a camera's moving pictures show how blood is spilling across the blistering earth of Palestine, of Yisrael. A shofar wails again and again from an apartment across the road. My ears ache with weariness. I hear the holy days unfolding to the sound of gunfire, crackling toward the young bodies of Um el Fam and Nablus. Wives and mothers are crying, shrieking with rage, beaten and cursing for the lives of their boys whose flesh was torn and shattered by rubber bullets. Last night, Avinu Malkenu lifted from the throats of the observant while well-armed soldiers aimed their guns at a terrified child near Netzarim instead of at the snipers behind him. Armies of children threw their bodies, their stones, their souls at machine guns, at missiles dropping from the sky. Death to the Jews echoed from the west, a fragile ancient alliance ripped apart as windows of stores were broken in Jaffa. And on a side road in the north, God is great rang out at the point blank murder of a young father bringing his old car to be fixed. The main artery to Akko and Svat is closed. I watched young soldiers wearing kippahs supplicate to the Almighty in our pretty wood-paneled shul while bullets seared the bodies of their brothers guarding Joseph's tomb. Our mother Rachel wept as her resting place was stoned. Yom Kippur looms ahead. Outrage and desolation burns into the streets, pelted into the eyes of the world. Names of God hurled like fire, like death. The prayers of Yerushalayim from all corners of the world slip like water through a sieve onto the torn hopes of mothers and fathers, their fingers despaired of their music, their voices joined, lamenting life blessing the eternal. I am quiet on my little porch, wondering if you are hiding under the tree below my balcony, wondering if you expect me to call out your attributes, to fast and wear white, or to rip and rend my clothes. Writing a, writing, reading a poem by Judith Bryce, who was a psychiatrist, and says she got a lot of her inspiration from talking with her patients. Judith Bryce, Questions of Betrayal. For a Jew, there is a fundamental question. How can I believe in God? After crystal knot and pogroms, after the boxcars, after the six million slaughtered, snuffed out by tasteless gas, swallowed forever by fiery furnaces, furnaces belching Jew dust over sparkling German towns, towns at work to expunge each final smudge of Jew, Jew dust to breathe, to exhale, to dust off the mantle, Jew dust to contaminate the air. 
Was it six million? How to count each separate shtetl deleted from the map? How to know each shivering woman forth naked to her grave? How to count the Jew dust flakes billowing brown into smoke? Can we ever know each faithless soul, each desperate life, each girl sobbing in the rain? How can we feel her, touch her? How can we make her count? For a Jew, there is this essential question. Do I still believe in God? For a Jew, there is yet another question. Can I believe in love? Love for my neighbors. Love for those I hate. Members of Hezbollah or Hamas, now during the bombings in Lebanon, Iraq, and Afghanistan. Can I feel the compassion and love I lost after Kristallnacht, after the boxcars, after my family was betrayed? Will I listen now to cries of others? Can I dare to hear their plight? Dare I glance through rubble and see a mother in panicked fright? Shall I bear witness to the nameless boy there crying? Will I choose to make him count? For a Jew, there is still this question. Will I practice my belief in love? For a Jew, there is yet the question. Can I believe in light? A light for redemption. A light for forgiveness. A light to shine on enemies and me alike to imbue each of us with hope. For our sake, our world's sake, is there space enough for each to have a home, a life, a love? Or must we all continue to betray, to kill, and all be killed, and all return to dust? For a Jew, there is but one last question. Is there a time for God, for love, for life? Ada Aharoni is the founding president of International Forum for the Literature and Culture of Peace. She writes in English, French, and Hebrew, has published 26 books. Her poem, Remember Me Every Time the Moon Rises Over the Sphinx, on page 144, was inspired by an Egyptian soldier's diary found in the Sinai after the Yom Kippur War, October 1973. Dear Lila, to you, my love, I breathe my last letter. I love you in all the ways love means. Remember me every time the sun sets over the pyramids and the moon rises over the Sphinx. Today marks the ninth year of my enrolling at the cursed military college. If I knew then to what bitter thorns it would lead me, the college would never have seen my face. I loathe the hours a man goes through while waiting for death. Remember me every time the sun sets over the pyramids and the moon rises over the Sphinx. I really believed what we were told, that we would never begin a war. But we have been ordered to cross the Suez Canal, and my blood, my bones, no, I have a few more hours to live. I will fight and die for Allah and Egypt, when what I want is to live for you, my Lila, loving you all my life, my Lila, my life. Raymond is a poet and a playwright and a performer. I'm going to read her poem in Kana. The 
Lebanese, excuse me, the Lebanese spelled it with a Q without the U, Kana. The town where Jesus, where John said Jesus at a wedding turned water into wine. The other Gospels missed it. They caught other miracles, but they missed that first miracle. The guests said, you're not like the others who just serve good wine till we're drunk. Later, Jesus said, I bring not peace, but the sword. But in that first miracle, there was nothing of sword. It's important you understand this, you apocalyptic idiots, Muslim, Christian, and Jew. A good party, that was all. People dancing those wedding dances, lifting a chair like they still do. A miracle that they can get it up there without dropping it. Or if they do drop it, without killing whoever's in it. But it's family they love there, so if they do a sword dance, it's just clacking them together like the Morris men, minor miracle of coordination. At the revels, they clacked so hard, you should have seen they broke the blade. At a wedding, that would probably be bad luck. It might be good to leave the swords out of it for good. That's a disarmament proposal. What do you think of it? What if we acted as if the whole world were a wedding with good wine till the end? What if you left your sword at the door and never retrieved it? And you just kept dancing and drinking all night like that first miracle and the wine never got less good? That would be a miracle. You know, I'm not just talking about the wine being good. I'm writing a little parable or a sermon for you. Yes, a dead prophet is not the only one who can do it. I'm saying we've seen what comes of bringing the sword. Now let's bring a covered dish and get back to the wedding. I like to think that maybe it's a wedding of people from two different sides. Ordinary miracle, two black-browed lovers of flame like flowering swords, gladiola, bird of paradise, what looks like a knife-edged sheath till it unfurls in good blossom, the angels each holding a stem of it at the door of the fiery world, and they beckon to you. They hold the, the flaming sword to protect the wedding, and they want to include you in this miracle. Not blood, but good wine that pours. Let us dream of it. So this is going to be the last poem. Is this microphone working? Yeah. OK. And then we're going to have music. This poem was written by Naomi Shihab Nye, who's a Palestinian-American, absolutely magnificent poem, poet and absolutely magnificent woman. I kind of fell in love with her when I met her. She is just like no one else on earth. The name of this poem is Jerusalem. And she opens it with a quote from someone named Tommy Olofsson, who lives in Sweden. So the quote goes like this. Let's be the same wound if we must bleed. Let's fight side by side, even if the enemy is ourselves. I am yours, you are mine. And here's her poem. I'm not interested in who suffered the most. I'm interested in people getting over it. Once when my father was a boy, a stone hit him on the head. Hair would never grow there. Our fingers found the tender spot and its riddle. The boy who has fallen stands up. A bucket of pears in his mother's doorway welcomes him home. The pears are not crying. Later, his friend who threw the stone says he was aiming at a bird. And my father starts growing wings. Each carries a tender spot, something our lives forgot to give us. A man builds a house and says, I am native now. A woman speaks to a tree in place of her son, and olives come. A child's poem says, I don't like wars. They end up with monuments. 
He's painting a bird with wings wide enough to cover two roofs at once. Why are we so monumentally slow? Soldiers stalk a pharmacy, big guns, little pills. If you tilt your head just slightly, it's ridiculous. There's a place in my brain where hate won't grow. I touch its riddle, wind and seeds. Something pokes us as we sleep. It's late, but everything comes next. Naomi Shihaka. Oh, 
had a different note than harmonized. <laughs> we were wet and do that. Falling. 